Hello, Buddhist geeks. Um, I'm Emily Horn, and today on the Geeks of the Round Table, I am joined by Vincent Horn, <laughs> Kelly Sosan Barra, and her lovely puppy, <laughs> and <laughs> Kenneth Folk. Um, we are here today to discuss um, the recent Wired article, um, Enlightenment Engineers. And while there's a lot of different themes that we could explore, we picked one in particular um, to start this series of conversations. Um, one of um, the quotes that I wanted to bring into this conversation is from the article. Um, quoting the article, it's not just Google that's embracing Eastern traditions. Across the valley, quiet contemplation is seen as the new caffeine, the fuel that allegedly unlocks productivity and creative bursts. Classes in meditation and mindfulness paying close, non-judgmental attention have become staples at many of the region's non or most prominent companies. So just to kind of open this exploration um, with the question, does meditation really make you more productive and wealthy? And is it a way to get ahead? So I <laughs> thought we could start by um, just briefly going around everyone just giving kind of a couple thoughts on the subject, and then we will open it up to some creative exploration here. Um, Vincent, would you like to open it? Just sure. Context? Yeah, happy to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was talking with Kenneth actually a couple weeks ago. We were exploring this topic of does meditation make you more productive and, and wealthy? And I looked at my productivity and looked <laughs> at my bank account and I was thinking, mm, I'm not really sure. <laughs> it has for me. Um, and as I was thinking more about it, I, I really started reflecting on kind of that this is sort of a values question, it seems like, that this is obviously an article in Wired magazine, so this is going out to sort of all of the main folks in the tech uh, sort of entrepreneurship scene, which is really has a hub in S Silicon Valley, San Francisco, where Kenneth lives. And there's a certain set of values there. I mean, if you've, if you've been to Silicon Valley, you see the values reflected. Um, and the values have to do with being more productive, more efficient, more effective, creating organizations, generating wealth, you know, for venture capitalists or for yourself. Um, and I think what's happening is that culture is getting interested in meditation and they're naturally trying to understand it in terms of what they already value. So the interesting thing about this, though, is that I, you know, for most of us, that's not the values we've come into meditation with. Um, we've had different value sets, uh, some that come from the Buddhist tradition, some that come from whatever subcultures we're part of. And I think part of the challenge of this article is, is there's a clash of values here. Mm -hmm. And I think it could be easy to say, oh, well, the values I have are the right values. And, uh, you know, it's, it's more interesting to, like, use meditation to observe, you know, the microphenomena of mind and body and see everything as a process um, and to wake up to something that's sort of bigger than this small identification with a particular thoughts or patterns. Um, and that's a, that's, a, that's a really cool value. At the same time, that's obviously not what Silicon Valley values. And so I, I'm really curious, and I have an open question about this. If, if people value something and they use meditation for that aim, may, maybe it will actually help them do that better. Um, and, and maybe we won't like that because that's not what we're valuing. Um, and there's a big conversation about which values are better. Um, and and are, are, are they sort of equal? Is it just a question of which ones you know, you prefer, or are certain values going to actually lead to really um, bad things for the environment and the ecosystem, you know, which is one of the concerns that I have about the value of just constantly increasing productivity and wealth um, without any sort of awareness or, or not much awareness of the kind of larger systems that we exist within. So those are just some thoughts. I was thinking a lot about values and meditation. Thank you. Yeah. Kelly? Yeah, just kind of riffing. I'm going to say something completely different now after Vince. Um, just riffing off values um, and, and just really looking at stages of development and how each stage of development actually um, can use meditation as a tool to enhance their own value meme of where they're at. And, and I think that's an interesting um, way of looking at meditation. Medita meditation is just not one thing. Meditation can be many things depending on what world view you're coming through, what stage of development you're at, and what you do value. And um, at a more kind of 
scientific, business-oriented, um, developmental level, or you know, kind of like that mindset. I think anything that you, anything that's outside of you that you can see to use to make anything else better, is ultimately going to become a tool to improve yourself. And yourself in this situation seems to be really based on what your values are, at least what I got from the article. So like using, so saying like contemplation is the new caffeine. That is a huge statement. What does that mean? Why are we saying this? <laughs> and is it true? Um, so reading this article, Enlightenment Engineers, and then having the topic of this show be called Enlightenment Engineers? Question um, mark. I've just really found myself having a lot more questions than I do viewpoints or answers or kind of statements to the article itself, and I'm just really curious um, how people make the leap from meditation to being more productive to being more wealthy, and um, I'm just really curious, uh, kind of that that trail of thought, how we how we get there, and then kind of wanting to look at that and seeing if we can unpack that that thread and seeing you know what's accurate what's not accurate is it true is it not true are these just side effects just like happiness and compassion and joy is productivity a side effect of meditation that's an interesting question what about you Ken? since I'm in San Francisco a lot of my students are, are uh, tech people and, and I hear this all the time, will meditation make me more productive? And I always say, I don't know. I don't have any data to support that. I know, I know some people who will say, uh, yes, meditation definitely made me more productive. So I'm thinking of one fellow who is very successful in business. He had a big breakthrough, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, and he says that uh, somehow informed his business success. I know another person who's also very successful in business and he's been meditating for about six weeks and he says meditation makes him more productive so the jury's out there. Uh, I know some people, by the way, another person who's very successful in business and he says if everybody meditated nobody would get anything done. <laughs> what happens is you get to the point where a lot of the, a lot of the drivenness fades away you don't care to um, you don't care to work your fingernails to the bone to do whatever it is that you thought was so important. Now that certainly makes a lot of sense to me too. Uh, so could go either way, and it and it may be that meditation has exactly no bearing on your success or lack thereof for most people. If you think of uh, mind training, mental training, as, as a big, wide open kind of a thing. You can train this mind to do all sorts of things. Well, it may be that you can uh, design specific practices that would make you more productive. Again, I don't know. It certainly is true that you can design practices that do something to how you experience the world that make you uh, that, that lead to peace of mind. That's, that's something uh, you hear a lot about from meditators and, and I can get on board with that. So meditation can lead to peace of mind if you do it in a certain way. Riffing off of what Vincent said uh, ab about values, well the way my values are, I wrote an essay about, I, read, I wrote an essay a couple weeks ago called Meditation is Not a Productivity Tool. And I made the case that <clears throat> using meditation for product productivity is kind of like using your car for a greenhouse. Your car actually might make a good greenhouse. It has windows, it will heat up in there. You can probably grow a great crop of groceries in your car. <laughs> but your car is good for a lot of things. And in fact, one of the good things that your car would be good for is if your crop fails, you could drive to the market to buy groceries. <laughs> So, uh, so I think of this, meditation would be really good for almost everybody, I think, if they do it according to my values, which is that even if you don't succeed in business, you'd still be okay. Now, I want to 
make sure nobody heard that as if you meditate, you won't succeed in business. And if you meditate, you shouldn't care if you succeed in business. I didn't say that. I actually think it would be wonderful to succeed in business. I would like to. I have never been able to do that so far. But wouldn't it be nice to know that when everything goes wrong for you, at the end of the day, you're sick, you're old, you're dying, and your business just failed, you could still be okay. Now that would be worth meditating for. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I, I agree with you, Kenneth, on some things and um, really appreciate what Kelly and Vince has said as well. One thing um, that I've been thinking about in relationship to this is um, that with meditation in my experience, um, there has been times that has not led to greater productivity at all. Um, and when it has led to what I would call greater productivity or creativity, it's been times where I've been able to see, um, I've been able to see um, through this illusion of a contracted sense of self. Um, and so that spaciousness has allowed more um, birthing or becoming in a, in a genuine, authentic way, which um, in my experience, it does seem like a caffeine, I guess we could say that. Um, and then the trick is, though, the minute that that is um, grasped onto, it creates a solid sense of self again, and then therefore the meditation has become a method and a stagnant process that actually has not been, you know, it has not led to greater productivity. Um, so I think that there's a tricky balance with this um, topic about, um, you know, what, what really happens when we sit down to practice. And um, I can relate to the values question, you know, what are we practicing for? And I think that motivation is really important with determining the, um, there was another quote from the article that I'll bring in at this point, and then we can open it up to discussion. Um, it, it brings up the question of return on investment. And um, the article said, entrepreneurs and engineers are taking millennia-old traditions and reshaping them to fit the values goal-oriented, data-driven, largely atheistic culture. Forget past lives, never mind nirvana. The technology community of Northern California wants its return on investment in meditation. And... Um, to me, that's like there is a there is a quality. Of course, like we want something when we meditate, and there is a process of um, letting go of um, the seeker or that that grasping quality, and that's natural. Um, and in the other sense, it it may not be bad to to want something. So I just want to open it up now to just a discussion around these topics and see where we go from here. Um, I'll, I'll kick it off because um, kind of something you said about sort of seeing mind training as like a broad thing. Um, that, that's one thing I was reflecting on is maybe certain kinds of techniques actually are better for becoming more productive. Like I can remember, you know, a year or so where all I did was shamatha meditation and all I focused on was the breath. And I remember during that time my mind was hyper-focused uh, most of the time. And I felt really clear and, and, and focused a lot. And I think perhaps during that period, maybe my productivity I increased in some way. Although, to be honest, most of what I was interested in being productive with was meditating more. So it's not like external productivity increase. But then, and I think we've sort of talked around this, you know, the techniques where I've, for instance, done Vipassana practice, where I've, I've sort of deconstructed the breath and deconstructed my experience. There have been years where I would go to work, for instance, and just feel like I couldn't do anything. And I would still manage to slog through, but mm -hmm. there'd be like weeks at a time where I felt like I was completely useless, and I suspect I, I was more useless. Um, so I, anyway, just interesting to think about the way that different meditation techniques might actually have a bearing on, on whether or not we sort of are productive. Uh, and, and that's sort of assuming that that's even important to, to someone if they're meditating. Yeah, I'm really interested in this whole, again, the meditation is a new caffeine, because if you look at caffeine, it's a stimulant, it's a drug. Are we really saying meditation is the new drug? You know, Silicon Valley, or in general at all. I just think that's an interesting statement. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, pop the meditation pill. 
Yeah. <laughs> There's something really unsettling about that to me. Um, and then at the same thing, it's like I keep my mind keeps associating it with Red Bull too. It's like people drink <laughs> Red Bull to get like a lot of stimulation. And I think I think the trick, or for me, what comes up is that in the beginning, meditation hat was like a stimulant to me because I was seeing all these things and it was very um, exciting. Um, but to stick with it through the through the unpleasant parts, um, I wonder if that I wonder when that comes in as well. Um, yeah. Well, I sorry. Go ahead, Kenneth. I've been thinking about a new way to model the, the benefits of meditation. I'm always thinking of new ways to model the benefits of meditation, <laughs> and uh, and the new one is called ramification. And ramification, if you if you if you uh, trace the Latin roots, it means branching. So the way this works, if you imagine a tree. And at the very tippy top of the tree, that's where it's growing vertically. So if you can manage to stay at the, at the top of the tree, um, you're growing all the time. However, if you, if you look at what happens to a tree, it comes up, and whatever is in the, in the very top of the tree, if you put a little mark of paint on the, the leaf that's at the top of the tree, it doesn't stay at the top. It, it rolls over to the side. Always, always branching like this. So this is the ramification. Now you can select any of the many things that can happen while you're meditating. You can say, sometimes when I'm meditating, I become more productive, and then you fixate on that and you say, that's what meditation is all about. It's about productivity. Well, but then what happens is you branch off to the side, and maybe you spend the rest of your life obsessing about how meditation will make you. Um, Productive. Meanwhile, at the tip of the tree, something new has happened. Something else has happened. So imagine all the things, all the benefits, or the, all the models that people have for, for meditation. Some people say, um, if you meditate enough, you'll stop thinking. Okay, so that's one of the branches that goes off, and it, and it basically stagnates over to the side. If you meditate enough, um, I'm trying to think of what are some of the, some of the vaunted benefits of meditation. You'll stop having emotions. Okay, so that goes off to the side. But if you always stay at the tippy top of this thing, that's what's exciting to me. You're always, uh, you're always objectifying the subject. Whatever I think it is, and this is, this is, um, this harkens to Robert Keegan's model for, for developmental psychology, mm -hmm. we're always looking through these colored filters. So if you imagine a spotlight at the theater, you point it at something, and there are these little plastic uh, gels, filters yeah. called gels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you put the amber gel over the spotlight, and then everything looks yellow. Well, we're doing this all the time. Uh, I'm walking around with the filter on, and I don't see it as a filter. Well, the minute I can objectify that, see it. Oh, that's the colored filter I've been looking through all day long. That's why I'm depressed today. Now this isn't easy. It sounds trivial to do it, but it's a it's a whole process of it's an iterative process through a lifetime. But now I've objectified this lens and it no longer has me, as Robert Keegan would say. I have it as a lens, one of many lenses that I look through all day long. So that is what's at the tip of the tree in the ramification model. Always saying, what am I, uh, what's the filter, what am I uh, assuming, uh, what am I identified with as a self? And if you do that, it's this constantly dynamic process. We don't know what meditation is going to do for us. It's not a, it's not a thing you can get. It's, it's an activity, it's a process, and Let's see. I love that making subject object. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. I, you know, Kenneth, I'm I'm thinking about um, another conversation that we had earlier, and um, I, I'm thinking also about the Wisdom 2.0 conference, which which we went to earlier uh, in the year. And what's so interesting is it seems pretty clear that much of Silicon Valley shares like a certain kind of lens, right? A certain kinds of assumptions. It's a culture, you know, and everyone kind of buys into the culture, and there's a power behind that, obviously. 
It's a culture of innovation. It's a culture of entrepreneurship. And at the same time, uh, I'm sort of thinking of in Star Trek, the Borg. You know, the Borg were the species of of creature who just went around and assimilated everyone into their into their into their unit uh, and sort of assumed, okay, this is the the most superior way to be is to be a Borg and to have this collective hive mind. And so they just went around, just like whether whether the autonomous you know beings wanted to be part of it or not, it didn't matter because they needed to be like assimilated. And I sort of see something similar in this article. It's like. It's like, here, here's what we're doing, this meditation thing. We're talking about objectifying the subject. And yet what comes out in the Wired article, it makes it sound like what, what, real, what we're really doing is like teaching meditation so that you can you know, enhance your productivity and wealth. And I just see the Borg, you know, the Borg of that culture, trying to assimilate these certain kinds of things. And I, the question it brings up for me is, as meditation teachers or as uh, meditators um, who care about this stuff, um, do we, do we, one, sort of say, okay, that meditation is really valuable, and if people engage with it, you know, it's like a Trojan horse, right? If people engage with it, then maybe they'll get involved in this ramification process, and they'll start objectifying their own assumptions. Um, so, so why not just let it be assimilated to a certain degree, kind of like a virus, you know, let, it, let, let the virus be uh, injected into the system. But the, now the question is, uh, should we do that, or should we sort of push back and say, hey, wait a second, like, we're actually dealing with different values here, and uh, let's actually have a conversation or a dialogue about what meditation really is and how it's changing, and, and what kinds of values and assumptions are you having that may not be that helpful from this point of view. Um, like one of our friends, Hokai, he, he often talks about these lenses as... Uh, sort of revealing certain things, but then concealing other things. And, I mean, there's so mu obviously so much power and influence um, and money in Silicon Valley, and if they're going to start, you know, using meditation to help whatever they're doing, should we just sort of give it to them without asking any questions, or should we push back and say, hey, if you're going to use this, like, we're going to have to have a conversation about what this is really about. Um, so that, that's going back to the values question. I I feel like that's that's really important, and I know that's not what you're doing, Kenneth. You're you're working with people, but you're having these kind of conversations. I I imagine. Right. Well, in this in the article, it talks about how Luke Nosek, that one of the uh, PayPal founders and now um, venture capitalist, very successful in San Francisco, um, uh, he sponsored me to come out here to teach. To teach um, meditation in San Francisco, and we had a we had a plan. It, uh, it's a plan that I call "Enlighten the Illuminati," and, and Luke was totally on board with this. Enlighten the Illuminati. If we can if we can help some of the most influential people in the world to to um, get a clue, that's that's the phrase that comes to mind for me. Now, notice that's based on my my value systems. I want them to get a clue the way I think I have a clue. Yeah. So there it is. I will cop to that. But I think if they did, if they could em embrace some of the, uh, if they could realize some of what I consider to be the real benefits of meditation, so um, seeing experience as process, which I think is the very, the very essence of awakening, the the um, the compassion and empathy that come that often come uh, as a package with that. And by the way, you can train specifically for compassion and empathy, and that would be a part under the larger umbrella of benefits of meditation. Well, it would be great. I think it would be great if the people who love who who run the world uh, love meditation and and love the benefits of meditation as I do. So this has been kind of um, it's been kind of a stealth move the whole time. Because because no matter what I say, the 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 um, tech people I talk to think that this is a meditation tool, and I keep telling them I don't know that it is, but they still think it is. So a productivity tool. Is, uh, uh, sorry, a productivity tool, right? So so uh, all I can do is keep saying what I think the real benefits of meditation are, and uh, kind of sneak it in there as as I'm being assimilated by the Borg. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, something David Loy, uh, who's a Zen teacher, asked recently, he said, if you know, if mindfulness is a Trojan horse, what's Troy? 
And I think that's a really good question because I, I think we assume that Troy is what we've experienced as the benefits, but I'm not so sure that that's what they're going to actually find. Um, obviously, like you're saying, you know, there's, there's this, there is a momentum behind these assumptions that's really powerful. And uh, there's the Darth Vader move, as Ken Wilber put it, the Darth Vader, Vader move is always possible. <laughs> you, know, the, <laughs> you can always use whatever power or force that you've developed in, in service of something. Uh, and I think meditation in that sense is, it's not completely value free maybe, but, but it's not, it's not, it doesn't have an inherent set of values either, um, obviously. So anyway, that's, my con that's sort of my concern, and, and you're right in the heart of dealing with that question, so, so props uh, for you know, going right into the, uh, to the, to the Illuminati uh, den and <laughs> hanging out and partying <laughs> and teaching meditation with the, uh, you know, the Silicon Valley folks. I think that's, I mean, I think what's cool about it is you're not sort of avoiding the situation and just immediately discounting that whole culture, which I, I've seen that's a move that a lot of, Buddhists uh, and traditionalists kind of make is like, oh, well, they're like evil, the corporation, media, whatever, and so therefore, like, we just aren't even going to mess with them. And I think that's also like a weird, that's a weird cop out. I'm well, listening to, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm listening to this and my heart just feels really tender. Um, yeah. It's like, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily wrong to go into meditation with the intention that it will create more producti productivity. Um, and I, I also feel like my motivation for practice has changed so many times throughout you know, the last 11 years that I have, it's like I almost have such a deep trust in the process that I feel people will find different avenues for exploration and if it changed, yeah, mo I don't know. I guess I just wanted to voice that. And going back to the lens, um, the different lenses with meditation, it's like there almost has to be a fluidity that gets developed with, okay, so maybe I am viewing it through the productivity lens. And then five minutes later, maybe it can sw switch to the awakening lens. And five minutes later, maybe it could sh um, shift to this like deeper compassion and wisdom lens. And um, I don't, I feel like, that's one of the things that if we keep going at it through pro like this lens of productivity eventually that has to wear itself out like I just don't I don't see I mean we can look at our culture right now and we see the devastation that we're causing through that particular lens and um, I hope that I guess my genuine hope is that the um, you know Silicon Valley and all of us can can really um, even start to examine our lenses. Um, so I'll put that out there. And the other thing I want to voice is that the article was very, and I can hear it some in our language here, is very masculine oriented, um, which is, you know, it's like the goal driven, and I have that, you know, I, I, I have that, like I want to be good and I want to succeed, and, um, and at the same time, with this fluidity of, of taking different perspectives, um, I think you know there is a, there is a opportunity for us to hold both the goal orientation and this more relaxed ebb and flow um, trusting process of of meditation. Um, so I just want to put that out there. Mm. And yeah, I, I'm a big fan of like whatever it takes to get to the cushion and I don't know if this is right or wrong, but <laughs> like whatever it takes to get you to the cushion and then from that point really exploring your motivation and your assumptions and your desire for practice. And I think if that exploratory process is going on, um, I feel really good about whatever it takes to get there <laughs> um, because I just feel like there's an inherent kind of process that the, that the person would go through to kind of even go deeper into their own assumptions about why they're on the cushion at all. I mean, my main motivation for practice has always been um, to suffer myself less and for those around me to suffer less, suffer me less. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's never changed. That's all. That's been true from from day one. It it's, it takes different forms. It looks different. It feels different. But at the end of the day, that's always been, you know, and then if suffer, I don't want to suffer myself anymore, and I don't want others to suffer me. Um, and, and I, yeah, it's a question, like, what do you guys think, like, is there a right, is there a right motivation, you know, we have mm. right livelihood and, you know, 
all these things? Is there a right motivation? I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't see that there's consensus among either people today or among the great teachers throughout history. I don't see any consensus about why you should meditate. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's even a little bit mysterious to me how we even are able to group all of these practices together. Yeah. I mean, mm. it's, it's almost as though we're saying that anything that involves sitting there cross-legged and not talking for a while is all of a, of a piece that's all um, should go under some particular heading. And I don't know, maybe so. But in the, the, in the Upanishads, you had people wanting to get to certain blissful states. That was just as good as it got. You sit there and bliss out and, you know, and die. And then you had... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then the Buddha uh, had, had his own version of, of the Cosmic Suicide Club. So for him, uh, it's not even good enough to sit there and bliss out. You have to become a Buddha and, and then die, and only then will it be good enough for you, because then you won't be suffering anymore. Uh, which actually, uh, most of us don't relate to that very well at all, um, as far as I can tell nowadays. Most people want to uh, have the, more of the Mahayana version of this. We want to have life and relationships and meaningful work, and we want to awaken. Uh, something... Uh, something I wanted to follow up on that Emily said, this um, idea of, of masculine and feminine, feminine motivations. So a, a more feminine approach would be, it's not goal-oriented. Just, I don't know, see what happens. And that's, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of instant freedom in that. Oh, okay, so I can even relax from having to get ahead. That is good. And then there's the, the more goal-oriented approach. Uh, how, how much can I master meditation, which would, I suppose, be a more masculine approach. Now, in the article, Vincent and I have talked about this before. In the article, Noah Schachtman, the fellow that wrote it, um, assumed something. He framed it as though the default position going back forever was meditation must never be goal-oriented. Uh, but that's not true. So if you look at the earliest texts uh, that we know of in Buddhism, which, which are the Theravada texts, uh, the, the dying words of the Buddha were said to be strive diligently. It's a very famous saying in, in uh, Southeast Asia, Apamadena Sampadeta in, in Pali. Strive diligently. Because, why? Well, because you have to awaken in this lifetime, that's that's the gig. So, uh, this idea that the the traditional meditation, traditional Buddhism, is all about not being goal oriented, it turns out not to be true. We see those themes all along the way, uh, theme and counter theme. I saw a bad surfing movie a long time ago, and there and there was one good scene in the movie. It was, it was about, comp there were some competitive sur surfers, world-class competitive surfers having their competition uh, on the beach in Hawaii. And then about half a mile from them, also surfing, were another group of non-competitive surfers. And the non-competitive surfers, who were also, by the way, great surfers, uh, said, those guys, they're, they're kind of immature. You know, they're over there um, strutting and trying to defeat each other, but we're, we're soul, we call ourselves soul surfers. And it was understood that the soul surfers kind of had the moral high ground there. And, and I think that's fine. So there are always going to be some people who just do it for the love of it, and in some cases achieve excellence anyway. And there are, other, there are also going to be people who want to compare and compete and have some metrics for success, and their whole thing is about gaining excellence. I think it's all it's all good. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I just want to make sure that when I when you know bringing the feminine and the masculine, I feel like you know I keep getting the Zen phrase not two but one not not one two you know so it's it's like I I feel like where we're going 
as a collective, and this is a broad statement, but um, is some sort of integration between those two approaches where the Buddha said, you know, strive, get enlightenment, whatever you said, Kenneth, I don't remember exactly, but then, and then the other part of the relax, accepting um, freedom is here, readily available in this moment. So I feel like there is a balance between those two that um, can even be seen externally in our culture that we are, we are um, exploring the edges of. Um, and I feel like that is a really important um, exploration for our culture um, to go through, especially because we tend to preference um, one side of it, um, and that's just been tradition. You know, sort of to tie what you guys are talking about back to the original question of values, um, I've been reading a really good book called Leading from the Emerging Future, and it's by a guy named Otto, Otto Schwarmer. And he, uh, I think he's friends with John Kabat-Zinn, and, and there's sort of, sort of an influence from the whole mindfulness movement there. But he talks about, you know, sort of the, the downsides of the infinite growth model in terms of our economy and, and, and the systems that we use. I mean, we're using probably about 1.5 planets worth of resources uh, for the one planet that we have right now, and that seems to just be increasing. And I, I, it seems like the mindset that gives rise to that is the kind of, like you were talking about, M, the, the imbalance or the kind of when someone is just all about growth and development and about their growth and development, mm -hmm. uh, about making more money and, and, and maximizing ROI and, and it's sort of just the single-minded focus on sort of pushing one, one or two kind of particular things forward. Well, if we do that like we've done with like economic growth, um, then the, the problem occurs because we don't exist in this sort of infinite system where there's an infinite amount of resources. We have to stop at some point and consider how our striving diligently at whatever we're doing is affecting the systems or the broader context that we exist within. You know, at what point, you know, for instance, when I was started off meditating and I was super, super... Uh, charged about you know getting enlightened and I was talking to you Kenneth and Daniel Ingram and you guys were saying hey this is possible that you know you don't have to think of this as this esoteric thing that only these old dead dudes achieved you know that for me was awesome and yet um, Emily can attest that during those first few years I was sort of alienating her judging her for not having the same motivation uh, getting competitive with her you know acting like I was more enlightened than her <laughs> And, you know, it's like, uh, yes, it, it really helped for me to focus, but, and yet I was, uh, you know, from the outside, probably just this really obnoxious asshole. <laughs> I mean, so, um, it's just really interesting to think about those two, those two sides. And as I've learned how to relax more, I think, you know, I've probably become a, a little bit more pleasant to be around. Um, when it comes to talking about meditation and things like that. So just curious about how that individual, how that plays out on an individual level and then also how that plays out on a collective level. Yeah. Um, because it seems like we can't completely separate our individual tendencies and patterns and habits from our collective tendencies and patterns and habits that they're sort of tied together and, and maybe even to the point where the, the future of humanity is, is really de depends on our being able to deal with this on that level mm -hmm. um, so that we can you know, make sure we're not just going off in this infinite growth direction and not considering the whole, which is itself a movement of compassion and care um, and, and recognizing our limitations, which is also part of that. For me, it's been part of that being willing, being able to let go is sort of related to being able to recognize my limitations that maybe it's okay that I don't achieve you know the highest state of whatever <laughs> that I can just sort of enjoy my life a little bit too anyway just some thoughts to bounce off what you guys are saying which really appreciated yeah the whole neti neti not one not two and you see it in Zen as well it's uh, and it's it's quite the paradoxical contradiction where on one hand it's like redouble your efforts and then it's like have few desires but have great ones you know <laughs> so there's this striving 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 but then you know if you are gonna strive make sure it's like the most epic striving ever <laughs> and really narrow it down to just one awesome thing <laughs> and go for it <laughs> and at some point you have to step back right and see okay now that I've strived really hard and I've achieved this Nothing. thing, this, yeah, this no thing, like, what, you know, now where do I go from here? 
yeah, so for me, that's that's part of the joke. This this constant iteration, <laughs> coming back to ramification, always putting myself back at the at the tippy tippy top of the tree and realizing uh, all of the things that I thought I had achieved were just they're just dead branches going off to the side, and it, the the, the mm. it's what has become compelling is uh, being in the in the flow of it for its own sake. Just I, I want to see what's next. Nothing else is satisfactory to me. Mm. Stagnation doesn't cut it. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking you you can take any uh, any of the the very loftiest of of goals. So even compassion. There's there's a lot to a lot of people talk a lot about compassion, and, and I do too. But uh, that's actually just one of the things that's go that that if you put the paint on the leaf, it's going to go off to the side. If you become obsessed with compassion and stop objectifying the the uh, the subject, oh great! Now I've just uh, created a new identity as this person who's always compassionate. That turns out to be a phony deal. So everything has to be objectified constantly in order to keep moving. Mm -hmm. And wh where are we moving? Do you think? I don't think the moving moving doesn't go anywhere predictable. It's kind of movement for movement's sake. So just this, just this flow, because stagnation hurts. So you don't think we're kind of moving toward something like some sort of a omega point or uh, <laughs> going up in light in the singularity of enlightenment? <laughs> a, a global shift in consciousness. Oh yeah, right. That that has never made any sense to me at all. I don't see that we're inevitably going any place like that. I mean, there are going to be. If you look at si at history, there will be cycles. Uh, cycles. But the idea that everybody is going to magically become enlightened, this has been predicted so many times in history, and it just never happens. The uh, the pervasive peace, love, dope era doesn't doesn't come. Ram Dass had a great quote about this when, when asked about the New Age hypothesis that it's going to get better and get great. He said, well, at any given moment, there are some people waking up and there are some people falling asleep. Mm. Yeah, I imagine they balance each other out. <laughs> so far. <laughs> I, I feel like this has been a productive conversation. Yes. <laughs> 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 I feel we reached our goal. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we are coming to a close of the time um, that's allotted for this conversation, this part one series um, of the Geeks of the Round Table, Enlightenment Engineers, question mark. <laughs> um, so I just want to say thank you to all of you um, for you know being willing to dive into this um, topic. And um, I'm sure that it will continue. So with that, I want to just close out. If anyone has any last comments. Oh, thank, thank you. you. This has been fun. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.